Okay, so hopefully I am live uh, streaming. I had a couple of people call and say that they got called into work. So let's see if I can get the camera to come follow me this way. Come on, come over here. Let's see the Good, how are you? So we're going to talk about um, integrated marketing communication, and that was one of your uh, critical thinking challenges, the second critical thinking challenge in this class. So we're coming to the end of the class. This is the part of the class that's actually the part that most people think about machine marketing. It's the part that when you walked into this class, you probably thought was, was primarily marketing, and, and there are people out there who... who Insist that this is all there is to marketing is sort of advertising and promotion. And that's not quite true. I had a colleague who had a PhD in communication, and she she thinks that marketing is just nothing but advertising and promotion. And I tried to point out multiple times that marketing actually started out as probably, as you'll recall from the early discussions, it started out as an academic discipline, not as a human activity, but as an academic discipline, really more focused on the place component of marketing. And how do we get goods to people once we can start producing them in sufficient quantity that we no longer are just a local producer, but we can satisfy a larger and larger percentage of demand, how do we get those, those goods to them more quickly? And so as we go back sort of coming full circle, I'm reminding you how all of these things sort of integrate it's important to remember that although we talk about these four P's as individual topics, they are not siloed off from each other and they are, they're all related to each other. And so going back to that um, discussion of the four P's, three of the four P's have sort of models or unifying theories that we can talk about with regard that we've developed over the course of marketing history that, that allow us to really become uh, more efficient in that. Now, that's not to say that there are problems, but uh, that, that there are these unifying theories. And with regard to the communications process, integrated marketing communication is, is that theory. Like sort of just-in-time inventory control is one of the models that has become prevalent in the transportation IMC, has become the prevalent model. So just as sort of a quick review, what is the one P uh, that doesn't have either a good model or a unifying theory. If anybody online wants to answer as well, I'll read your answer from the text online and text messages. What's the one P that doesn't have sort of a any kind of unifying theory? I want to say price. It's price. Yeah, price is the one. It's the most maybe the most important because obviously it's where all the other P's come together. If you don't have a product to sell, you don't get a price, right? Price doesn't always have to be money, but price is where everything comes to, you know, advertising budgets depend on being able to get the right price. Developing products develop, you know, is, is dependent upon whether or not you can sell the product for a profit, right? So price is the one where everything is reflected in terms of what people are willing to sacrifice to get that product. And there is no unifying theory that we've, we've come up with that determines how you should a priori go about getting the right price. Now, one of the things that we have seen as a result of COVID that I'll point out is that although we say we, there are these models that have helped us with some of these uh, other components, they can be very fragile. And we found that out during the COVID crisis in terms of, so we have this idea of just in, just in time inventory control, which historically, if you went back in time, uh, you'd go into a, a grocery store or, or a retail establishment, and if you didn't see a product on the shelf, you'd say, well, can you check in the back and see if you have any of this? There is no back of Walmart. I mean, there are some back parts of it, but primarily the whole store is a giant warehouse that's sort of dressed up 
And if it's not on the shelf, the chances of them having it sort of in the back, now there are exceptions to this, but in the back are, are really minimal because they have this idea that, you know, you don't want product sitting out there on the shelf or taking up space that's valuable any longer than is absolutely necessary. Well, when we got to COVID, one of the things that happens with this just-in-time inventory control is what happened to a lot of the supply chains, and it became very difficult to overcome. So, for example, it can be one of the things that I am addicted to are actually not these wipes, but wipes like this. I have the Clorox wipes. Any of you use the Clorox wipes? I am, like, addicted to the Clorox wipes. I buy them, you know, at Sam's in the bulk in the five canister packs that have 77 in each canister. And I, I use them constantly in my business before COVID. I mean, I was like an obsessive, you know, white person. And what happened with COVID? Two things disrupted that inventory, that supply chain with COVID. What happened all of a sudden as a result of this illness. In the early stages of COVID, and they still tell you this, although the best evidence seems to suggest now that probably your chances of catching it from touching something are less. It seems to be primarily a airborne illness, but we didn't know that in the, in the early stages of COVID. So what happens with products like this? that led to a problem in the supply chain, a huge disruption in the cycle. So like All of a sudden, yeah, people, I mean, people who, nobody was, I was one of the few people that was really obsessed. I mean, people bought those wipes, obviously, but then you have this, this national or this global pandemic and everybody is running to the store trying to find wipes like this. And two things happened that have led, it's only in the last two or three months that you've started to see those products return to the shelf that really disrupted. So this is how an example of how, how fragile that model can be because two things disrupted it. First of all, there's all of a sudden this increased demand for these wipes as people are starting to, to wipe everything down and become very paranoid about COVID. The other thing that happened was there was a disruption in the manufacturing of those wipes, which led to a decrease in the supply, even if there hadn't been the increase in demand, which was that those masks that you all know, the ones that you're wearing or not, but the ones that are the disposable masks are made from the same product that they use to make those wipes or the Clorox wipes. And so now there's this increase in demand for these masks and everybody's trying to get that. And so there's a, a, a product shortage in the actual manufacturing. And the, the Clorox white manufacturers um, couldn't get enough of that product in order to fulfill uh, the, the increase in demand. And so it, it was a very fragile system, but all the same, we have developed these models that are very sophisticated and when things are running and if there aren't major disruptions in those supply chains that allow us to be very efficient. Price is the one where we haven't developed an, a unifying model or a unifying theory. With regard to communication, we have also developed this idea of a unifying theory. Now, this has become very, uh, this has become very prevalent in the academic literature and a lot of practitioners still see it as disparate functions under the uh, pr promotion and advertising banner and a lot of people who, who practice in these various fields, actual practitioners will say, well, IMC is a nice theory, but you know, um, you have to understand the medium or something like that. My response to that is, is that if you don't use IMC, you don't engage in IMC and you don't speak with a unified voice in IMC, your clients will do it for you. If you are not consistent in your message and you do not coordinate all of these disparate types of communication, these different touch points that you have with your various customers, constituents, or clients or friends, or however you're using marketing, they will come up with a consistent idea themselves. They will come up with what they think your product is or what you're trying to say. So, it's important 
And I don't think it's just an academic. This is one of those areas where I've had practitioners tell me, well, that's a nice academic theory, but you know, um, you, you got to understand print. I mean, like, and, and it's different than television. And that's true, but in terms of that consistent unifying theme, you really should should use IMC to, to do that. And if you don't, your clients will do it for you. So promotion is the fourth element that we're talking about in the marketing mix. And of course, this is the one that we wait until the end of the class to talk about. It's the one that when you walked in, you thought was the, the primary one that we probably be talking about because it's the one that you are bombarded with every single day. And this is actually the one and the assignment that I gave you on finding an ad and telling me why the ad is great, giving me a link to that ad is, is one of the more fun assignments because it's fun to watch advertisements. Although you don't want to watch them when you're watching your, your series, Game of Thrones or whatever. And that's one of the reasons that Netflix is popular is because you subscribe to it and there's no ads. It's still fun to watch ads. I mean, there are, there are times when people actually do go out of their way. Even people who don't like football watch the Super Bowl for the ads. And the ads this year were enormously disappointing, in, in my opinion. And they have been for, for a number of years, actually, with regard to the Super Bowl. But people actually go out of their way to watch advertisements. So there is a unifying theory here for promotion. It is integrated marketing communication, as I've been saying. And the promotional mix are all the tools that are used to inform our friends, if we're talking about marketing ourselves, or our potential employers, or if we're a business, our customers, or our clients, or our patients, or whatever we call them, about the benefits to try and persuade them to use our products, benefits, and then to remind them of the benefits that they enjoyed from those products. Why is it that McDonald's, McDonald's has a huge market share of the fast food industry. And lots of big brands in that industry, market, McDonald's is a huge dominant share, and a lot of even established brands in that industry probably are going to go broke. I was reading an article um, yesterday on the restaurant chains that this author is predicting may go broke in 2021. And as some of those go broke, McDonald's will again benefit. And one of the ones that they're predicting that may start closing um, the larger percentage of their doors is Burger King. And Carl's Jr. was another one that they listed as, as a company that was on the verge of collapse. That means that there's even fewer competitors out there and McDonald's has an opportunity to uh, pick up those to pick up those customers, right? So why is McDonald's, given their, they are the 800 pound gorilla in that sector, why do they continue to advertise? We all know what McDonald's is. Right? I mean, we, it's fast, cheap, consistent food. Although I question whether it's really all that cheap anymore. But it's to remind people, right? So that you don't forget. I mean, everybody knows what McDonald's is. You're not gonna, you're not gonna get probably people to all of a sudden decide, particularly those people who are, you know, vegans, that they're gonna, you know, all of a sudden try McDonald's because there's very few things on McDonald's menus that that don't involve some meat product. And you'd be amazed at how much is even in things that you don't think about in terms of animal product. But to, to keep those people that are using the product to remind them, right? And they launch new products to try and stay relevant. When we talked about product development, they're constantly coming up with new products to try and compete. One of the things that they did is they started noticing that they were losing market share in the breakfast market to Starbucks. And so, and even though McDonald's coffee is rated consistently as better quality than Starbucks coffee, Starbucks, again, is the tool of the devil. They were losing market share. So what have they done in order to try and recapture that market share? If you've noticed, their buildings are becoming more like Starbucks, and they started having a McCafe option where they actually have some of the more exotic type coffee caffeinated drinks, like vanilla iced uh, coffee and things like that. 
So to remind them later about the benefits, to inform them of new products that we're bringing out. And a program that coordinates all the promotional activities together to speak with this consistent voice is called integrated marketing communication. So this is the communication model. And if you can't see it, for those of you that are in the extended section, the model is you start with a sender who's going to encode. They're going to decide how they're going to present the message. They're going to encode it. They're going to transmit that through a medium. It's going to be decoded by the receiver. Then there's encoding that goes back so that we can monitor decoding. And you've got this. Uh, this nice loop in theory, right? Now that can be break down in several parts of this process. And one of the major places that it can break down is in terms of noise. And so I want to take a minute to read uh, a part of uh, the biography of my one of my heroes and one of my favorite people to talk about, Warren Buffett. How many of you know who Warren Buffett is? Nobody knows who Warren Buffett is. His name. At one point in time, he was the wealthiest man in the world. He is still one of the wealthiest men in the world. He is the chairman of a company called Berkshire Hathaway. And let's look here today what a Class A share of Berkshire stock So let me switch screens. So today, a Class A share of Berkshire Hathaway stock is $406,505. One share of Berkshire stock is. is $400,000. So he's enormously successful. There's an old, an old adage that, um, you know, he understands one of the things that I think has made Buffett successful is he understands arbitrage. And I think I told you this adage before. There's an, there's an old adage in uh, the finance world that says, and it's based on an even older adage that says, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for what? A day. a day. You feed him for a day. If you teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. If you teach a man to arbitrage, you will feed him and his family for generations. Some of you have probably seen a movie called Pretty Woman with uh, Richard Gere and Julia Roberts. Richard Gere is an arbitrageur. He breaks up companies because they're worth more at one point in time um, than, the, than, than the whole, some of their parts. There's arbitrage opportunities there. So, at one point in time, Warren Buffett, who is called the Oracle of Omaha, is called upon to rescue a company that he was heavily invested in, that Berkshire was heavily invested in, and was having problems. It was called Solomon Brothers, and they were one of the major, one of the five largest investment banks in the United States at the time. And they were involved in a lot of scandals. There have been several movies that have been made about this incident and the uh, culture that surrounded Solomon during the 1980s and 1990s. One of those movies which details the guy who it's a fictionalized version of the guy that we're going to talk about in this passage that I'll read you 
his name is John Godfrey, and the fictionalized version of him and his wife, who was called Marie Antoinette, the Marie Antoinette of Wall Street, were fictionalized in a movie called Bonfire of the Vanities, which was not very popular. And probably some of you have not seen that movie. It's an older movie now. Melanie Griffith played his wife in, in the movie. But it's if you're a business student, it's worth watching. Another movie that fictionalized this or was based on this is called The Wolf of Wall Street. How many of you have heard of that movie? The Wolf of Wall Street. Two of you have heard of it. Three of you have heard of it. Leonardo DiCaprio played, I believe, in, in that movie. And it details sort of the culture that was prevalent. So in the 1990s, there was a trader in the bond department at Solomon named Paul Mosier, and he was submitting, there's a cap on the amount of bonds that you can buy from the U.S. Treasury. And so he was submitting false bids under different clients' names to be able to purchase more securities than was allowable. And this comes to light, and I'm looking just to make sure I get the numbers correct. Solomon was fined $190 million for this infraction, which at this point in time doesn't seem like a lot of money. When we start talking about, you all have, have gotten into the world where we're no, when I was growing up in the 1980s and 1990s, billions was a big number, billions of dollars. And it's still an enormous number for us to try and wrap our heads around. I think even millions of dollars is difficult for most of us to wrap our heads around. And I'll give you an example of this, how, how difficult it is to sort of think about these things. But you all have, have now heard, you know, in terms of when we talk about government bailouts, when we talk about government stimulus of the economy and the infrastructure bill that Joe Biden is pr proposing, we're talking about not billions of dollars now, we're talking about trillions of dollars. But at the time, um, 190 million, which is less than a billion, was, was an enormous amount of money. And uh, to give you a perspective of how difficult it is for, for most of us to wrap our minds around this kind of thing, I used to be vice mayor in the city of Guthrie. And at that point in time, when I was vice mayor, I think our budget was about $10 million. And that was actually inflated because of the way we accounted. So there's two parts of the city government. There's the city of Guthrie itself, which has income that comes in from sales tax. And then um, there's a, a, a sort of quasi private part of the city, which is called the, the public works, which sells actual product which in most cities in Oklahoma, that's water. In Edmond, they're really lucky because they have two components, which is water and they sell electric. They buy electric wholesale from og and &E and then they sell it. So the public works is sort of the, the business side. It's where we actually sell stuff. We can't sell police protection. It's hard to sell a unit of police protection. So you rely on sales tax for that and, and fees from some other things that you get. But... Our budget was about $10 million. And I would actually study the budget every year. And I'll never forget one of my colleagues when I went in and I started going through the lines of the budget. And I'm like, I want to pull out this. And he's like, oh, somebody actually read the budget. And I'm like, well, yes, Randy, that's our job. We're supposed to read the budget. And everybody else, with one exception on the council, which was my best friend who was a, a lawyer, was ready to pass a budget, a $10 million budget, with no debate because they couldn't wrap their minds around $10 million. No debate on the budget, but by God, when it came, the, the item after the budget was talking about the purchase of new police cars and how much time do you think we spent debating? If it hadn't been for me wanting to discuss the budget, there would have been no debate on a $10 million budget, but how much time do you think we spent debating the color of police car? that we were going to purchase for the city. That debate went on for an hour and a half because it wasn't just the color of the car, it was also whether we were gonna buy Fords or Chevys. And we had, we had committed Ford men 
on the council and we had committed Chevy people on, I mean, it, it was, it, they could understand Ford and Chevy and they could understand white police cars or white and black police cars couldn't understand $10 million. I couldn't gonna, gonna pass the whole thing. That's going to let you buy the police cars. No debate. Going to debate whether or not we're going to have white and black police cars or white police cars or unmarked. But it's just incredible to me, right? So when we talk about these numbers, $190 million was the fine for the infraction, which is still an, an incredible amount of money. And they were required to set aside another $100 million in restitution for any injured parties. Now, Paul Moser was really doing this I think as a trader without a lot of oversight, but ultimately in these situations, as Harry Truman used to have on his desk, a sign that says the buck stops here, the buck stops ultimately with the CEO. And if you don't know what your people are doing, that's a problem. And this CEO's name was John Gutfrey. He's the one that's portrayed as sort of the protagonist character in Bonfire of the Vanities, and Melly Griffith is portrayed his wife, the Marie Antoinette. So John Gutfried is going to, you know, sort of be called to account. They ask Warren Buffett, who is a member of the board, because Berkshire Hathaway, which their Class A share is worth how much today? $400,000 to sort of step in and oversee trying to get this whole situation and this corporate culture at Solomon under control. And so this passage that I'm gonna read, and we're gonna look at this model and try to figure out sort of where it breaks down at certain points along the process in, in talking about this. So John Gutfrey, the CEO, is he starts out as friends with Warren Buffett Warren Buffett as somebody who even few of you, fewer of you have probably heard about. Um, his alter ego is an older man who's the vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, a guy named Charlie Munger. And Charlie Munger is a, is a lawyer. And he's the vice chair and enormously wealthy. Uh, he, he's part of a, a law firm in, uh, I believe, Los Angeles, California, or was. And he's even older than Buffett. And if I were a, this is just as an aside, if I were a investor in Berkshire Hathaway, I might be very concerned about my class A shares, which are $400,000, because the value, in my opinion, the real value in Berkshire Hathaway, because they are an investment firm, is in the heads. And there's a reason that it's, it's this much money, because Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger are brilliant. But Warren Buffett's in his 80s, I think. I think Charlie Munger is approaching 90 and Buffett's had prostate cancer. Charlie Munger is blind, at least in one eye. I mean, these, these are two guys that are, that are not going to be around for much longer. And a big portion of the value of Berkshire Hathaway is in their head. It's in, it's in Charlie Munger's head and in Warren Buffett's head. But. So in the 1990s, in the early 1990s, Buffett takes over Solomon and is trying to save it. So I'm going to start, and there's probably nothing worse than being read to, but I'm going to read to you so that we can kind of look at various stages of this and see where in this process we're breaking down. In the mournful spring of 1992, as Solomon staggered to its feet, the question of how to deal with those who had nearly brought it down remained unresolved. Second only to Mosier in the public's assessment of culpability was John Gutfried. In the end, it was he who was responsible, despite all of the legal advice that reporting was not required, for the position they were in. When it came time for Gutfried to discuss the money he would receive from the firm, 
he asked for fair treatment. He had been promised as long as Buffett and Munger were alive that he would receive fair treatment. Now, however, it turned out that the party's opinion of what was fair differed dramatically. So this is the first part here in the process. What is meant by fair? We use these words, and again, this goes back to hearkening back to our early lectures when I talked about ethics in marketing and the pervasive nature of that topic in the discipline, that these are not trivial questions. And in fact, you'll oftentimes hear people in the hard sciences disparage the social sciences like marketing by saying things like, it's not rocket science. And my response to that is, rocket science is easier. Rocket science deals with very specified, laid out, concrete, mathematical formulas. Those formulas, so if we look at a formula just for something sort of simple in math that, we, that I think is sort of simple, and I put this symbol, I put this formula on the board before, lowercase sigma xi minus mu squared over n. So this is the square root of uh, sigma xi minus the mu over n. And students, when I put this formula on the board, always, you know, like, oh, math, math is crazy. Math is hard. It's actually not. And this is a simple formula, right? Compared to what it takes to launch a man into space. But if you understand the order of operation, now I'm not going to talk about abstract mathematics, where there are debates in abstract mathematics. But we know, right? I mean, we've, we've had a lot of experience with, with putting people in the air what it takes to do that. And it operates within very specified limits that we can predict with high degrees of mathematical certainty. That's easy. So when people say it isn't rocket, rocket science is pretty easy. If you do it enough, if you do, this is a simple formula. If you do it enough, you can do, I can give you a set of numbers and you'll all come up with the same answer after we go through how to calculate it. And you don't even have to do this by hand anymore. You can take your uh, HP 12B2 financial calculator. You can enter in the data set that I give you and it will spit out a standard deviation really quickly. That's easy. Rocket science is easy. Marketing is hard. Because what we're talking about here is Gutfried's going to start marketing himself to try and figure out first, he's going to try and market himself to Buffett and Munger to try and get what he thinks is fair. Now, this is really hard. We use these terms all the time. And unlike this, where we can plug in, if I give you a set of numbers, we plug those numbers into the formula. So the first thing we're going to have to do is, you know, what, what's this symbol? X stands for a, a set of numbers. I tells us that we're going to look at every number in that data set. Right? So the first thing we're going to have to do, and this is the, the symbol Mu is the symbol for mean. So if we just look at this to start out with, we're gonna so we're gonna we're gonna have a set of numbers. We're gonna have to look at the set of numbers. We're gonna have to look at every number. And then the first thing that we're gonna have to do because we're gonna have to subtract the mean is we're gonna have to figure out what the mean is. Right? That's where we're gonna start. It takes time, maybe, but it's certain. 
When we get to marketing, and by the way, the, the math and some of the marketing formulas makes the math and rocket science. When we start talking about structural equational modeling, it can make the math and rocket science look really simplistic. We're gonna, we know what this is. What's fair? We use this term all the time. So Gutfried is asking for, I wanna be treated fairly and Munger and Buffett say in this first paragraph, when the time came for Gutfried to discuss the money he would receive from the firm, he asked for fair treatment. He had been promised fair treatment as long as Buffett and Munger were alive. Well, they've lived far longer than this. Now, however, it turned out that what the party's opinions of what was fair differed dramatically. So what's fair? Where are we breaking down? Just with this word in this communication model, where are we beginning to break down here? with regard to the word fair. Let's think about this in terms of a less complex problem. This problem is really complex because you've got this guy who is CEO of this huge firm while you've got this underling who's, you know, like he's got thousands of employees and there's this one guy who makes a lot of money. I mean, all of us would think that this is a fairly high guy, Paul Mosier. He made millions and millions of dollars, but he's not really high up. There are, there are hundreds of them on the trading floor. And you're talking about the CEO, right? And you got this one rogue guy out there who's submitting false bids to the, to the treasury to get bonds. And do you know, if you have thousands of employees, what one trader who may be being paid millions of dollars, and a lot of people, a lot of us would say, look, if you're paying him millions of dollars, you ought to know what he's doing. But you don't. If you're the CEO of a, uh, if you're if you're Warren Buffett and you're CEO of Berkshire Hathaway, which depending on how you count has over three hundred thousand employees, do you know what all of them are doing? No. So let's let's think about something that's maybe easier to think about in terms of fair and where this this model can break down. Let's talk about fair treatment in this class. That should be easier, right? This is this is a huge problem. You've got this CEO who's head. He, he didn't know what this one guy was doing. He's trying to help Buffett and Munger solve the problem and figure it out, and he's been promised fair treatment. Now, this is going to be really complex in terms of what's fair, in terms of when you start talking about millions of dollars. Let's talk about fair treatment in here. And the disparate components of this word that we can come up with. I think we probably all in here have a similar idea of what's fair. Let's, let's talk about treatment in this class and grades. What's fair in terms of treatment and grades? That we should probably, you're gonna ask me, you're gonna say, students tell me this all the time, they'll come to my office and say, well, that's not fair. I've, I've had students do this to me. They've come in with their essays and they'll say, I always got A's in high school. This is not fair. And if I just said something like, I'm the teacher and I can assign a grade and I didn't like your essay, we'd probably all agree that that's not fair. If I just said, look, you know, I, I just don't like your essay. You'd probably say that's not fair, right? And I'd probably agree with you. If that's what I, if, if students came to me and young professors have problems articulating. When I, I started teaching here when I was 22 years old, I've gotten really good at grading essays. I can do it really, really quickly. But to begin with, you know, when you become a professor, you don't go through education classes. You don't take the, you just start. When you become a, to be a, to be a, an elementary school teacher, now I, I disparage the College of Education in many respects, but to be an elementary school teacher, they're going to teach you how to teach. Now, I, I don't think they teach you what to teach, and that's where I start disparaging them, because the College of Education focuses so much on how to teach that, that their students don't 
get anything. When my mother became a teacher years and years and years ago, in, in, the, in the late 1960s and early 1970s, she went to a Catholic college, a Jesuit college, and it was not a four-year program. It was a five-year program. You had to get a substantive degree. So you had to get a degree. She was an English teacher. You had to get a, an, an, a history teacher. You had to get a degree in English and history, and you had to meet the requirements of that degree program. And then you did an extra year. You did one or two semesters in learning how to teach. Colleges of education have flipped that on the head. They have got three years of teaching you how to teach and one year of, you know, general education. So, for example, when I was a political scientist, I didn't start out as a marketer. When I was a political scientist over in the land of hippy dippy, I would have students that would say to me, I teach American national government. And I'd say, why did you take this class? And they'd say, I took your class because you're not Dr. Jones. We had a Dr. Jones who I thought was funny. They didn't think he was funny. He was old. Um, but I just, I'm not at all interested in government or politics. It's boring. And I would say, I, did you have high school civics? And they'd say, uh-huh, because that's required. And I'd say, did you have a coach that taught it? Uh-huh. That's why you hated it. The requirement to teach civics in high school are that you had one political science class in college. And so you end up with people who don't know anything to teach. I had a history teacher who told me, I'll never forget this, literally, I guess he'd had one history class, so they thought he could teach history. And he told me that, never forget this, the Spanish Armada was the largest ship to ever sail the seven seas. The Spanish Armada was the largest ship to ever sail. And I, um, his name was Lowry. And I'm scratching my head. And I'm like, um, first of all, Lowry, uh, that was a long time ago. We build ships that are much bigger now. Like, I mean, you should see like ships now. Like, no, no, no. The Spanish Armada was the largest ship to ever sail the seven seas in, in all of history. And I'm like, Larry, um, the Spanish Armada wasn't one ship, right? It was an armada by definition is, is not one ship. He also told me that Frenchy Huguenot was this guy who settled in Canada. And I'm like, Lowry, I think you mean French Huguenots. Again, not one guy, right? So they don't, they don't teach you. My point is they don't, when you become a college professor, you know a whole lot of stuff to teach, but you don't have any classes on how to do it. You have a whole lot of, you've got a degree, right? You've got an advanced degree in this stuff. At, at that time, I had a, a master's degree in political science. You have this advanced degree and you know all of this stuff, but you don't necessarily know how to teach. So you struggle. And, you know, I'd, I'd have essays and students would come in and say, I, I don't think your grade is fair in my essay. And I would struggle. And I would sort of think, you know, I know what good writing is and this is not good writing. I had a student early on submit an essay that began like this. Have I told you all this story before? I approached this problem eager as a squirrel in an oak forest. When wham, bam, the answer came to me like an elephant in a circus tumbling routine. And I wrote back, I leapt like a gazelle to the conclusion that you deserve an F for forcing me to read this dribble and you need to take a creative writing class to get this out of your system. And he didn't think that that was fair. I thought I was being 
more than generous. So when we talk about these words like fair, what do we, we use this all the time. It's not fair. And we think we know what we're saying, but where is it breaking down in this model? With just the word fair, your, your assessment of my essay is not fair. Now, rather than saying, you know, I leapt like a gazelle to the conclusion you deserve an F, if I had said, look, and I, ultimately I did. I said, the assignment said that I needed you to take a position on a set of hypothetical facts and provide a recommendation. And in doing that, what you need to do is you need to have an introduction that has a thesis statement. And he said, I had an introduction with a thesis statement. It was, I approached this problem eager as a squirrel in an oak forest. No, that's not a thesis. That's you blathering on in an attempt to, I guess, make me, you know, think that you know what you're talking about or to, to, to play on my flattery. A thesis statement is you have given me a hypothetical situation in which a customer is injured by a product that he has purchased from Walmart. I'm going to argue that um, the store is liable for his injuries because they are in the chain of supply and as such have liability under the strict liability theory of torts. That's a thesis statement, right? And then you're going to argue why that individual or why Walmart is liable. Under our strict liability of torts, we attempt to place the party that is least vulnerable in the better position and ensuring that he who is most capable of paying does. That's the theory of strict products liability, right? I mean, those are things. So if I just say, you know, I left like a gazelle, you would probably say that's not, or I, I you know, to the conclusion that you, you deserve an F. You'd probably say, and I'd probably agree with you, that's not fair to just say, you know, to just say that. That's not, you have to have some rationale. But when we get beyond sort of simple concepts of fairness, what's fair in this class? Does fairness and equality have anything to do with each other, for example? Is fairness and equality, are those concepts that are related? Yes or no? You're shaking your head yes. Why? I feel like equality just falls into the fairness category because when people, usually equality, you're not being fair to someone. If so if I'm treating somebody unequally, I'm not being fair to them. Yes. I'm sure you want to stick with that. I'm not going to say I disagree with you. You want to stick with it? Yeah, I'll stick with it. Okay, so everybody in here will get an F. I'm treating you all equally. Yeah, when you put it that way. Everybody in here is going to get an F. Everyone's equal. It doesn't have anything to do with the fact that she's blonde and you have black hair and you have, you know, highlighted hair. I'm not saying, you know, you're getting an F because you have highlighted hair and both of them uh, have, you know, solid colors of hair. Um, that, that's not what I'm saying, right? Everyone's getting an F. Everybody's being treated equally. I just want to say, so fairness, I feel like is giving everyone the same opportunity. And oh, okay. Like making now we've easy. now we've qualified it even. Okay, it's giving everybody the same opportunity. So it's not based on some arbitrary. So I'm going to treat you all equally in some respect, right? In that when you walked in, I didn't say things like, you know. I just don't like, since I have black hair, I actually don't anymore. I started turning gray, like Anderson Cooper gray when I was 16. So this is like very dyed, but before it was black, it's now mostly gray, right? You know, I, I, I just don't like blondes. So sorry, you're, you're, you're out of luck. 
I'm not going to say that. So you're saying that it, there is equality in some sense and that everybody's going to have equality of opportunity. And that's going to be fair. Okay. What about this? Did everybody walk into this class with the same, were you really equal? Did you really have equality of opportunity? You're shaking your head now. Why? I mean, there's just so many variables that nobody can control. So, like, education can be a variable, where you live, where you work. Okay. What you have to do at home. Right. Like, in the words of the first, fair. In, the, in the words of the first President Bush, some of our children don't show up ready to learn. I'm going to guess that most of you in this classroom showed up ready to learn because your parents probably had some, I mean, most people who go to college have some exposure to that. I don't think that, you know, I have, I have two bachelors, a master's, a Juris Doctorate, and a PhD. I don't think that's really remarkable. My stepfather has a PhD. My father has a master's degree. My mother has a master's degree. They paid for my education when I went. But in some sense, there's a rough proportionality there, right? When you walked in, I didn't say things like, well, I can tell that Ms. Dosher, is that right? At the end, I had a hard time with all the masks, learning everybody's name. Um, because it's hard for me to remember faces when everybody's got this mask on. But, um, you know, I didn't walk in and say, well, you're obviously, you know, you're dressed well, you come in every day, you're put together well, you're, you're going to be okay. And uh, the rest of you, I'm not so sure about. Right? Everybody has the same opportunity in here. So when I brought the ducks, I, I keep forgetting to bring the ducks. Everybody has the same opportunity to raise their hand and get a duck or to get a marker or to text me with an answer to, to the problem, right? I mean, every, I, I'm not saying um, you're the only man, no markers for you. Don't, don't bother raising your hand, right? So we've got some idea. So where in this process, when we talk about in this, in this case where when the time came for Getfried to discuss what money he would receive, he asked for fair treatment. Where is this breaking down in this process? I think it's encoding and decoding. Yeah. I mean, he's saying, I want, so he's sending this message. He says, and this is a face-to-face -face communication, and he's looking at him. And a big portion of our communication is actually not just the words we say. It's not just fair. It's, you know, the, the sad puppy dog eyes that I'm going to give you when I say, be fair to me, right? And Charlie Munger and Buffett are having to decode what's meant by fair. Well, when we're talking about millions of dollars, there can be a lot of what we call, so this portion of the formula of standard deviation, if we wrote this formula like this, lowercase sigma, I'm gonna use that to give out, but if anybody gets that, remember to throw it away, because it's not working. Um, lowercase sigma squared equals uppercase sigma xi minus mu squared over n where i equals 1 to the nth, and I should do that over here, where i equals 1 to the nth, right? This part is called the variance. That part of the formula is called the variance. And if you know what the variance is, you can always get the standard deviation. If you get the standard deviation, you can always figure out what the variance is. The reason I put this up here is because when we're talking about millions of dollars, there's a lot of variance in there. And I don't necessarily mean mathematical variance. There's, you got three people 
one of whom is saying, I want you to treat me fairly. And the other two are saying, yep, we're going to be fair. And we're talking about millions of dollars and criminal culpability for a company. And what's fair, there's a whole lot of variation in there that we, so what would be a better word to use rather than saying, treat me fairly? You know, I, I think this, this communication process starts poorly because he says, I want you to be fair. And Buffett and Munger both say, yeah, yeah, we'll be fair. And by the way, I think Warren Buffett ultimately is one of the better businessmen in America and one of the more ethical businessmen. And I think he actually, I think he is somewhat fair most of the time. I'm not sure he was totally fair in this situation. What would have been better in terms of our communication? Because we're having a problem. He's encoding this. It's going through this medium, which is personal communication, which is my looking at you and all these other things. And they're decoding this and they're having uh, um, they're having this, this problem. Ms. Cummings says equity instead of fair. Okay. So equity instead of fairness. I think that's still got a lot of ambiguity. Again, equality, do we mean equality of opportunity or equality of results? We just did that, that exercise, right? I'm going to give you all Fs. That's equality of results. I like the word justice. Okay. Why do you like justice? I might be wrong, but I think justice is more like based off of rules. Okay. Your fairness is based off of like, what I think is fair versus what you think is fair. Like, okay. So fairness is, you think justice is a, I, I'm not sure I just, I'm not sure I agree with you, but for in your perspective, justice is more rule based. And so we could develop a rule in this. And one of the things that he could say is look, I want you to treat me according to the contractual obligations, which would be following a rule. Like I have this, so people in John Gutfried's position, by the way, who are at, at these big companies, they oftentimes have what's called a golden parachute, which means, and they had really golden parachutes at Solomon, by the way, if they were losing money, um, they, had, they, had, they had severance agreements that said that even if they were fired for cause, you couldn't take away their stock options and stuff that they had earned. And so you're saying that justice is more rule-based. Um, and I think it can be, there is, there's this idea in justice when we talked about, uh, when we talked about um, ethics before, there's this idea, there's something called the desserts theory of justice, which is you give people their just desserts, you give them what they're due, which can be following the rules. So we're going to follow the rules in this class. I have a syllabus that says this is the way you're going to be graded, and these are the items, and I don't deviate from that. I don't just all of a sudden pop up and say, oh, by the way, we're going to add to that. And I mean, the, the grade, it, it says in the syllabus that we're going to have some critical thinking exercises, that we're going to have four exams, and there's going to be an article review, right? Isn't that what it says in my syllabus? And I didn't all of a sudden say, oh, by the way, I've decided here at the last that you guys are just not doing so well, and I can't really, you know, um, I can't really give everybody F, so I'm gonna just throw in an, an, an extra assignment called uh, a research paper. You know, you, you, you have a research paper due. Um, is, is, do we have two more weeks of class and then finals? You know, there's a research paper due next week. That, that would seem to not be rule-based, so right? So you might say, look, follow the rules. What does it say in the contract? Rather than what's fair, why don't we why don't we look at what's in the contract? Gutfried's lawyer thought that he had made a deal with Charlie Munger on a fateful weekend in August the previous year, and that Munger had accepted a resignation letter conditioned on a lengthy list of severance terms Gutfried felt he was entitled to. Gutfried felt that he had fallen on his sword to save the firm and thought he was owed, now here's where it comes down to the nuts and bolts. He thought he was owed $35 million in back pay, stock, and severance. However, Solomon took the position that Charlie Munger had made no deal at all. The board agreed to interpret Gutfried's employee benefit plan strictly. 
What does it mean when we say we're going to interpret the employee benefit plan strictly? In law, we call this the four corners test, right? So you have this contract and there's stuff written on the contract and we're going to apply it based on what's written. And actually, in this instance, that may have been more fair. We're gonna, we're gonna look at the contract and we're gonna apply it based on what's written on the page. Now, the problem can be, again, in that even when we reduce something to writing, so in, in the first instance, he's saying, I want you to be fair. Buffett and Munger say, I'm going to be fair. His attorney starts talking to Munger and says, I want these list of things for my client. Turns out that, you know, he thought he had an agreement. They didn't have an agreement. What's the problem there? So the lawyer thinks, Philip Howard, the lawyer thinks that he has an agreement with Munger and Munger's opinion is, we don't have an agreement. What's the problem in the communication process in this? So I'm talking, and he should have known as a lawyer that, that, that he didn't have an agreement, in my opinion, <clears throat> as, because of one thing. What's the problem in the communication process here, in this model? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, it's the medium. Because the medium that he's using to say we have an agreement is, I'm talking to you, you're making facial expressions. I think, you know, what would have been a better medium for that? To reduce all of that to writing and memorialize it. Because now you've reduced, you've, you've eliminated, or you could potentially eliminate the ambiguity. Although even in a written contract, when we talk about the four corners test, you could oftentimes have ambiguity, even in that. Let's talk about the word, for example, platform. What does a platform mean to most people, to the average person? Like something that's higher? Like something that's, yeah, something that's high up. Right? That's exactly what it means to most people. It's something that's high, it's 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 a stage. A stage is a platform, right? This table, this table is a platform for your MacBook. That's a platform. If you're a computer person and somebody says platform, what do you think? This, this term should be like non-ambiguous. If you're a computer person, what's a platform? An iOS is a platform. Windows is a platform, right? Xbox, PS4. Yeah, those are platforms, right? It's not this. It has some analogy to that in that it, allow, it allows you to get above all of the, the background stuff, right? And interface with the computer. You're not having to look at the source code. I'm probably being overly simplistic. I'm sure my people who are computer science would just be horrified, right? So the medium is the problem here because he thinks he's got this deal and it turns out that they take the position that there's no deal and we're going to strictly interpret the stock options that you have, the benefits. We're going to in interpret the employee benefit plan strictly and also took back the stock options he had earned, even though the stock option plan contained no provisions allowing for forfeiture under any circumstances. Right. So now they're just being, they're just being, in my opinion, they're just being mulish. 
The board agreed to interpret Gutfried's employee benefit plan strictly, but then they decided they're not going to do it strictly because they also took back the stock options he had earned, even though the stock option plan contained no provision for allowing for the forfeiture under this or any circumstances. They actually had written it in. This is the golden parachute part. They'd actually written it in that even if you were fired for cause and gross negligence, they couldn't take away your stock. You could, they couldn't take away your stock options. The board countered with $8.6 million. Now you can see how fair is really, there's a big discrepancy there. He thinks he's earned $35.6 million, $35.6 million, and they're coming up with 8.6. Insulted and outraged, Gutfried turned it down. It just seemed wrong to me, he says. As a matter of principle, I fought. His lawyers interpreted the offer not as meant to inspire negotiation, but as so insultingly low that it had to be dismissed out of hand. In 1993, so they're, they're thinking, we're going to offer 8.6. This is a negotiation process. And his lawyer takes this as an insult. You can see, again, there's a breakdown in, in, in what we're thinking here. <clears throat> they offer 8.6, and they think this is, and he's like, that's insulting. That's not negotiation. We're breaking down in the encode, you know, like that's not an offer. That's, that's an insult. Arbitration is a process in which a panel of neutral parties listen to both sides and reach a binding decision to resolve a dispute. Arbitration is also a throw of the dice. It's trial by fire, by the way for its very nature, cuts off negotiations forever once a decision is reached. John Gutfried had been reduced to sitting in a small three-room office where he answered his own phones when his part-time secretary was away. He brooded over the fact that Susan, his wife, was now dubbed Marie Antoinette. Again, if you watch Bonfire of the Vanities, this is the part that's played by Melanie Griffin, by the press. Susan had told him to resign had told him, I'm sorry, told him not to resign, as if he had an option. She said it would make him unemployable, by the way. He became unemployable because as a result of the fine from the SEC um, and, and the, the Treasury, he was forever forbidden from being CEO of a publicly traded um, financial institution ever again. They had been cast out of New York society. The press had turned on him savagely in a way he had never imagined could, ha could happen, comparing him to felons like Ivan Boski and Michael Milken. Many of his former friends had abandoned him. Unassisted by Solomon, he was running up huge bills to defend himself in civil lawsuits. He wanted vindication through the arbitration process. But a public raking and digging over the whole Solomon mess, which might have saved his wounded pride, was guaranteed to alienate Buffett and make him less likely to compromise. After Buffett had staked much of his image on Solomon, Gutfried had let him down, and to retell this story in an arbitration covered at full yelp by a dogged press could not possibly inspire to inspire Buffett to reinterpret Gutfried's behavior more generously. So now again, we're talking about the medium. You're, you've now, because of what you're doing, you're now fighting this, not just in the face-to-face, -face, but you've got the press out there and the way, and this is important for integrated marketing communication. When we talk about public relations, you lose control of the message when it gets to the press. When things like this get picked up in the press, it can be good or it can be really bad because you lose control of your ability to manage that message from other people interfering. Now that he and Gutfried, now that Buffett and Munger, now that Buffett and Gutfried were no longer partners in Buffett's special sense of the word, 
transgressions he might once have eventually forgiven became larger in hindsight, and there were many. Even without the benefit of hindsight, they were large. The stock option repricing in 1987, which had cost Buffett so much money, the stern light cocked gun letter from the Federal Reserve, which Buffett had not learned about from Gutfried until it was too late. The meeting with Bob Glauber at Treasury when Gutfried had kept silent, which had also been kept from Buffett and the other board members. An equity plan that allowed employees to keep their stock options, even if fired for cause, which Gutfried had put before the board and the shareholders late in that fateful spring of 1991. Buffett felt the whole thing was a tragedy that should never have happened and that Gutfried's behavior had been some sort of weird aberration. Although he normally avoided conflict, if forced into battle, his proxies fought for him like cornered hyenas. Charlie Munger, who was inclined to say things like, Gutfried made Napoleon look like a shrieking violet, was appointed the bad guy in the arbitration. His testimony would be crucial because he was the one who had negotiated with Gutfried's lawyer, Philip Howard. It was the young president of the New York Stock Exchange, Dick Grasso, who chose the three graying arbitrators who would decide Gutfried's fate in a dingy conference room at the exchange building. A team of lawyers from Craveth, Swain, and Moon, backed by testimony from Solomon board members, employees, ex-employees, Buffett and Munger, began to pulverize Gutfried in a process that took more than 60 sessions and several months before the arbitrators. Over and over, the arbitrators heard about the meeting between Munger and Philip Howard, in which Howard reviewed the list of compensation Gutfried wanted and Munger listened in some fashion or another. Now, this is the part where, really, where I want you to really think about this and come up with some good answers. Um, in some fashion or another, all agreed, this is a miracle, they all agreed that Howard had left the meeting without a signature on Gutfried's severance papers, but there was no agreement how to interpret the rest of the events of that evening. Howard was certain that Munger had made a deal with him. This is where you'd start listening. Gutfried's lawyers called Charlie Munger as a witness. Frank Barron of Craveth Swain and Moore had attempted to prepare Munger, who was utterly impatient with the process. Although Barron had prepared Munger by himself, Munger, a lawyer who disliked paying legal bills, extemporized to the arbitrators that in preparing him for his testimony, Craveth had employed an excessive number of expensive legal paralegals and aspirin carriers. When he began to testify, every word that came out of his mouth had nothing to do with what we had gone over, says Barron. Putting Charlie Munger on the witness stand was the most nerve-wracking, hair-raising experience I have ever had as a lawyer. And I'm out of time, so we'll have to pick up with this. Uh, but I want you to think about this and let it sink in and look at this model. And be prepared on Thursday to pick up, and we'll, we'll talk about where some more of these problems have occurred um, in the breakdown. So if you got everybody, got, uh, um, everybody who got things come up, uh, markers come up and see me. I'm going to end the live stream and I will see you all on Thursday.